so these creatures engage in, in dominance disputes. And, and I think dominance is the right way to think about it because lobsters aren't very empathic and they're not very social. And so it really is the toughest lobster that wins. You know, and what's so cool about the lobster is that when, when a lobster wins, he flexes and gets bigger. So he looks bigger because he's a winner. It's like he's advertising that. And the biological, the neurochemical system that makes him flex is serotonergic. And you think, well, who cares? What the hell does that mean? Well, tell you what it means. It's the same chemical that's affected by antidepressants in human beings. And so, like, if you're depressed, you're a defeated lobster. Like, you're, you're like this. I'm small. I'm not, you know, things are dangerous. I don't want to fight. You give someone an antidepressant, it's like up, they stretch, and then they're ready to, like, take on the world again. Well, if you give lobsters who just got defeated in a fight serotonin, then they stretch out and they'll fight again. And that's, like, we separated from those creatures on the evolutionary time scale somewhere between 350 and 600 million years ago, and the damn neurochemistry is the same. And so that's another indication of just how important hierarchies of authority are. I mean, they've been conserved since the time of lobsters, right? There weren't trees around when lobsters first, first manifested themselves on the planet. And so what that means is these hierarchies that I've been talking about, those things are older than trees. And so, one of the truisms for what constitutes real from a Darwinian perspective is that which has been around the longest period of time, right? Because it's had the longest period of time to exert selection pressure. Well, we know we evolved and lived in trees something on the order of 60 million years ago. We're talking 10 times as far back as that for the hierarchy. And so the idea that human beings that the hierarchy is something that has exerted selection pressure on human beings is, I don't think that's a disputable, that's not a disputable uh, issue. How it's done it and exactly what that means, we can argue about, but like that sort of biological continuity is just absolutely unbelievable. I, um, it was funny because I revealed this finding, you know, I didn't discover this, I read about it, but I talked to my graduate students about it, I used to take them out for breakfast, you know, and they were a very contentious, snappy bunch. And, uh, and they were always trying to one-up each other, and they were quite witty, and for like six months, until it got very annoying, every time one of them one up the other, they'd stretch themselves out and like snap their hands like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was, that was very funny. It was, it was really very funny. So you see this in lobsters, and so that's pretty amazing. So, yeah. And one of the other things that's really cool about lobsters is that, um, let's say you've been like top lobster for a long time, but you're getting kind of old, and some young lobster just you know, wails the hell out of you, and, and so you're all depressed. But the thing is, your brain is dominant. But you don't have much of a brain because you're a lobster. And so, now what are you going to do? Because you just lost. And the answer is, well, your brain will dissolve. And then you'll grow a subordinate brain. Yeah, and so you, that's worth thinking about too, right? Here, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if any of you have ever been seriously defeated in life, you know what that's like. It's like it's a death, a descent, a, a dissolution, and if you're lucky, a regrowth. And, and maybe not as the same person. That's what happens to people with post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Their brains undergo permanent neurological transformation. And, and they then inhabit a world that's much more dangerous than the world that they inhabited to begin with. But we also know, too, if you have post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, that your hippocampus shrinks, right? It dies and shrinks. And you can sometimes get it to grow back. Your hippocampus shrinks and your amygdala grows. And the amygdala increases emotional sensitivity. And the hippocampus inhibits emotional sensitivity. And so if you've been badly defeated, the hippocampus shrinks and the amygdala grows. Now, if you recover, the hippocampus will regrow. And antidepressants actually seem to help that. But the damn amygdala never shrinks again. And so, well, so that's another lesson from the lobster. It's quite a terrifying one, but... But it's one, like, it's so interesting that you can relate to that, right? It's like, I get what that poor crustacean's going through, you know. 